We have Mauricio and Simon, and they should talk about the next five minutes, not me. But Mexico was one of the best case studies of trying to tackle this problem systematically. They did a number of things. The first thing was Mauricio got some of his, he got together a beverage panel that looked at beverages in the country because the increase in sugar sweetened beverages and calories from beverages in general was tripled over the last 20 years in the country. And he, he then went from there, and I'll come on. He later, they later developed with the leadership of the National Institute of Public Health. Simone was very involved in that. A whole coordinated uh, effort I'll talk about. They got the whole cabinet involved. They really got the government involved in the last government. And some of the things that they pushed, Jim would love it. They tried to push the physical activity in a major way. Uh, they pushed consumption of water. We really had groups of industry, consumer groups, and scholars meeting to talk about reducing fat, reducing sodium, reducing trans fats, reducing added sugars in the diet, and trying to deal with that. And I was at some number of those meetings, and there was lots of good dialogue on it. Out of that came some things that we'll come to in a minute. They really wanted to change the diet. They wanted to deal with a lot of, of the issues that I note there, and I'm not going to go through them. You've got the slide. They had, for, for one item, for school feeding, it was a year, a year and a half, maybe two years almost, of negotiation with the industry to finally cut out a whole lot of unhealthy foods and try to improve what vendors could bring into the schools at lunch. And they succeeded in that. Uh, they did a front of the package profiling. I actually got to be uh, one of the members of that, the chair of it, along with Simone, and where they tried to identify the healthy foods by, based on more whole grains, more fruits and vegetables, more beans and other kind of healthy items, and less added sugar, fats of unhealthy saturated fats and, and sodium and such to deal with in their country. Then an election occurred, the conservative government came in, Mauricio went back to be the director of National Institute of Public Health, uh, things changed, but we also had at the same time uh, a civil society that was getting itself together, a consumer federation, a wonderful leader that we've been working with in Mexico City, who got funding from Bloomberg and others to create a national organ group. And, and, and Bloomberg came in and gave money to, for research and lobbying and consumer federation to help change the culture of the country. And they really had a very strong campaign. Quite interesting, I'll give you a little, I'm not showing you the slides on it, it would, it would be take a lot, but there's some wonderful videos and other things on the web on this. And the big point was they really changed the culture, they got people to understand some things that I'll talk about in a second. And out of this, whereas we had the Senate wanting a 20% tax on sugar-sweetened beverages, we ultimately got the president to come forward because of those strong consumer pressure and say, we'll do a 10% tax on sugar-sweetened beverages. And all of a sudden, they added in an 8% junk food tax. Uh, it's a little bit crazy still what's being taxed. We're trying to get that rectified. We're trying to get nuts out of being taxed and tax some things that are less healthy. And, and, it's, and we're moving in the right direction. The point was they passed this tax. We, uh, they passed the junk food tax. They're doing some very minimal media controls. Mind you, they're doing it on children's TV in a limited number of hours. And what we know is that those kids are watching more adult shows from a national survey done so that the, the media part is not going to be effective unless you really understand what kids watch and control that. But these taxes went into effect. Uh, and the success factors, first and foremost, was changing the culture. The media campaign, the posters, talked about urine con azúcar. Urine in your sugar is diabetes in Mexico. Every family has a relative or a family member with diabetes. And doing that and linking that with the beverages and linking that with the other things really changed public opinion. Critical in this whole process. And, and, and we had, through the leadership of Mauricio, Simone, and a lot of colleagues, 
gotten the academic community more or less behind us. We had a subset of academics, just like here and in every country, funded by industry who kind of would put their voice forward. In fact, we had one vote that would have taken place, and somebody came from, from, from Columbia, who was the head of the Diabetes Association, saying, soft drinks are healthy for you. He was the head of the Latin American Diabetes. The next day on his website, he said he got $10,000 from Coke. Well, that got all over the papers in Mexico and wrecked his uh, story, but we had to put off a vote. It's this, so there is this complexity in every country we all know about, but the point was we changed this. We had champions in the Senate. We had a consumer organization that really helped to lead a public campaign. We, whether it's the consumer organization, CDC, or whomever, the point was we changed the public's understanding and sensitivity to these issues. We, they got these taxes. They got this very effective collaboration be going on between academia and consumer federations, which we've also got in a few other Latin American countries, really critical. We've got an evaluation going on that we're involved in. Steve Gortmacher's involved in some simulation work. Some an early result we, we noted up here on the slide. We had some very positive increases. Actually, our final results are a little more muted than this, but we did have had a decline in the sugar-sweetened beverage tax, and we've had a big increase in water intake during the first quarter of this uh, clearly, the evaluation has to go on, and we're going to look at the health impact. But this is a small tax. It's just that the junk food tax on top, top of the other one, we don't know how it will change the total diet, and we're hoping it will shift it toward more whole grains, more healthier foods. But we, don't, we haven't looked at all that yet. We're just in the process. So the success I, I can talk about, it's really built by getting all of the health community or the leaders across it together getting consumer federation together, trying to build a consensus first with enough of these organizations. And then we went out to the public. And in fact, the beverage panel guidelines were published in eight different journals in Mexico, the endocrinology group, the, this, the public health, et cetera, the same paper to get to different medical groups and then to get the leaders of those groups who are all members of this beverage panel to kind of speak out about the need to control the beverages. So we had a lot of the leaders involved from the beginning, and that was really critical in that country. And, uh, and now the tax revenue, we've got to see what happens, but it's supposed to go for potable water in the schools. And with the amount of revenue they got, it's double over what they predicted. We're hoping we will get that. Uh, so the lessons uh, for food systems across the globe are, I'm going to go through and give you some sense of what we're doing around the globe. And I can tell you that my slides, I wish I could give you the details, but there are six or seven countries that are going to be much more comprehensive than Mexico, a couple with perfect for health impact evaluations, with much stronger ones. But So action in low and middle income countries is taking off on the food system really quickly. Uh, but it's... Uh, uh, and what are the tools they're talking about? Clearly, one of the first things is food prices, shifting the relative prices toward healthier foods, away from the unhealthy foods, dealing with subsidies. Some have tried trade controls. I'll talk about that. Food labeling, there are two pop potentials going on out there. Different countries trying different approaches. One is a positive logo. One is a negative logo. I'll give you a sense of that. Marketing controls, we all understand. Some are going very comprehensive. Some are doing, like Mexico, really kind of rinky-dinky and going to affect 10% of the TV kids watch. So it just means they'll put more ads on the other shows kids watch. It really won't matter. Uh, restricting foods in public in, uh, institutions is common across the globe. Certainly more in low- and middle-income countries than here, and there's some really wonderful examples. The whole other parts of the food system and all that, I'll give you quickly some examples. So Mexico, I talked about taxation. Pacific Islands in Singapore, they've done things in the schools. But one of the most interesting things, when you go to low- and middle-income countries, hawkers, food vendors are all over. What Singapore did was they created facilities where they had to congregate in. So they could then do nutrition education with them. They could get them to change the fats they're using, get them to make things healthier, and so forth. Uh, 
Global trade never works. The World Trade Organization stops it in every country in the Western Pacific that tried it. Uh, front of the labor profiling has something. In Mexico, we were going to do it and get rid of the planes, which is really a critical part of it. It's happening in some other countries. We don't yet have any evaluations any place in the globe outside of Europe. And it seems to have an impact on what people buy. And it certainly gets industry to innovate. That's critical. Uh, claims and so on, I'm, I'm going to have to speed up. This is what Chile did. This is how they labeled the front of the label. This is the negative label. Most countries are going for a positive label on only the healthiest foods in each group, 10, 15% of the healthiest products within each food group. Uh, of course, we've got this going on in schools across the globe. Mexico also opted to try to cut the calories. They had so much calories from beverages and milk that they decided to cut that. Brazil is the most interesting in the school system, where 30% of products have to come from local small farms, and 70% must be fresh foods or minimally processed in the school system. You talk about a really effective potential program, but it's never been evaluated. This is one of the biggest problems I'm going to talk about. Uh, Thailand is the best country in the world for the information and education. Not in what Jim's saying, but going into the school, going into every village to have a person talking about fat enough belly. They're talking about waist circumference. It's very effective. And trying to educate people to cut their waist circumferences. Very interesting effort. 